Welcome to TTG's monthly employment law webinar. My name is James Partridge. I'm a junior barrister at TTG specialising in com commercial and employment law. As for today's talk, uh, its structure can be summarised as follows. First, I will briefly address the elements of a whistleblowing claim. This is the overview part of the talk. And second, I will address some specific issues arising out of three relatively recent decisions in the EAT concerning whistleblowing claims namely the decisions of Martin and Suffolk LBC, Oxford Side Business School and Heslop, and Secure Care UK Limited and Mart. As for the elements of a whistleblowing claim, the first thing to note is that a whistleblowing claim is not so much a claim in and upon itself, but rather a phrase commonly used to describe causes of action pertaining to what are called protected disclosures, as defined by Section 43A of the Employment Rights Act 1996. The two main causes of action pertaining to protected disclosures are, first, detriment claims brought pursuant to Section 47B of the ERA, by which a worker has the right not to be subjected to any detriment by any act or any deliberate failure to act by their employer, done on the ground that the worker has made a protected disclosure. And second, unfair dismissal claims brought by virtue of Section 103A of the ERA, by which an employee will be regarded as having been unfairly dismissed if the reason, or if more than one, the principal reason for the dismissal is that the employee made a protected disclosure. With that in mind, broadly speaking, the components of a whistleblowing claim can be broken down as follows. The first issue to determine is whether the claimant has made a protected disclosure within the meaning of Section 43A. This issue can be broken down into two questions, namely, first, whether there has been a qualifying disclosure within the meaning of Section 43B, and if so, second, whether the qualifying disclosure has been made in accordance with any of Sections 43C to 43H of the ERA. A number of sub-issues arise out of these two questions, but a complete analysis of these sub-issues is beyond the scope of this webinar. Suffice to say that section 43B will be dealt with in more depth in the next slide, and as for sections 43C to 43H, these set out the manner or manners in which a qualifying disclosure must be made in order to comprise a, protect, comprise a protected disclosure. The most often cite, cited sections are either section 43C, which allows for a protected disclosure either to the worker's employer or to the person responsible for the relevant failure, or section 43G, which sets out the conditions to be met in respect of a disclosure made to unconnected third parties, such as the press. So, if it's established that there has been a protected disclosure made by the claimant um, or disclosures, the second main issue is whether there is a sufficient causal connection between that protected disclosure and the detriment if it is a section 47B claim, which of course gives rise to the prior issue of whether there is a detriment at all, again, a topic beyond the scope of this webinar, or whether there's a sufficient causal connection between the disclosure and the claimant's dismissal, if it's a section 103B claim. Having given this very broad overview, I turn now to three relatively recent EAT cases where one or both of these issues fell for, for greater consideration. The first case of interest is the EAT case of Martin and Suffolk LBC. The main point of appeal in that case was whether the first instance tribunal had applied the correct legal test for determining whether there had been a qualifying disclosure for the purposes of Section 43B. The text of Section 43B1 provides in material part that a qualifying disclosure means any disclosure of information which in the reasonable belief of the worker, that's the claimant, making the disclosure, is made in the public interest and tends to show one or more of the matters listed in subsections 43B1A to F. I won't go through all these matters, but examples include whether a criminal offence has been or is likely to be committed, whether a person has failed or is likely to fail to comply with any legal obligation, or whether the environment is likely to be damaged. In Martin, his Honour George James Taylor 
found that the first instance tribunal had failed to apply the correct five part test set out by his honor judge Auerbach in Williams and Michelle Brown AM and emphasized that although depending on the case it may not be necessary to decide each question posed by this five part test perhaps because the claim effectively fails at one of the first hurdles it is however important uh, to adopt the structured analysis arising out of this five part test so what is the test in short it breaks down the text of section 43b into five distinct elements or conditions first there must be a disclosure of information second the worker must believe that the disclosure is made in the public interest third if the worker does hold that belief it must be reasonably held fourth the worker must believe that the disclosure tends to show one or more of the matters listed in subparagraphs a to f of 43b and fifthly if the worker does hold such a belief it must be reasonably held as noted by his honor judge Auerbach in the Williams case itself all five conditions must be satisfied for there to be a qualifying disclosure and the case of Martin serves as a welcome reminder that the tribunal must or at least should be taken through and consider all five parts of the five part test when to determining a whistleblowing claim and a failure to do so may render the subsequent judgment vulnerable to appeal the second case I'm addressing is the EAT cases of Oxford Side Business School and Heslop. The main focus of the appeal in this case was whether the first instance tribunal had applied the correct legal test for causation in a detriment claim under section 47B. At first instance, the tribunal had found that the employer that had been materially influenced by the claimant's disclosures relating to procurement obligations when subjecting the claimant to the relevant detriments here effectively determining to dismiss the claimant from her post without any real due process the tribunal also found however that the causation test for an unfair dismissal claim under section 103b was not satisfied the eat upheld the first instance decision finding it had correctly stated the legal tests and applied those tests. In so doing, the EAT <clears throat> in this case reconfirmed the following four key points. First, the correct legal causation test in a section 47B claim is as stated in the Court of Appeal in the case of Feckett and NHS Manchester, namely whether the employer in subjecting the claimant to the detriment had been materially influenced in the sense of there being more than a trivial influence by the protected disclosure. Second, that this legal causation test is different than the test applied in a section 103b claim and so there was no real tension in this case between the tribunal's finding that the section 47b claim was established but the section 103b claim failed. Third, pursuant to section 48.2 of the ERA, uh, while it is for the claimant to show that the disclosure had a more than trivial influence on the detrimental treatment, the respondent is required to show the reasons for their action, and if they do not do so, inferences may be drawn against them. So section 48.2 in 47b claims effectively shift to a degree the burden of proof onto the respondent in favour of the claimant. Fourth and finally, uh, whether the employment actions are unreasonable or unjustified, the AT found, is not determinative of the question of causation. However, where the acts comprising the detrimental treatment are of themselves unreasonable and or unjustified, this may be relevant to the question of the claimant's motivation in imposing the detrimental treatment. In other words, unreasonable acts carried out by the respondent without proper explanation 
may give rise to an adverse inference against them. Ultimately, this case does not break new ground. However, it is a very useful, in my view, point of reference for practitioners wishing to find in one place a summary of the principles to be considered when addressing the issues of causation in a section 47b claim. This leads quite nicely to the final case for this webinar, the EAT case of Secure Care UK Limited and Mott. In summary, in this fairly short judgment of Heather Williams KC, the employer's appeal succeeded and the case was remitted on the issue of causation for the section 103b claim because the wrong causation test was applied. Secure Care UK Limited serves as a healthy reminder that the legal causation test for an unfair dismissal claim under section 103b differs from the test for a section 47b claim, notwithstanding both claims relating to protected disclosures. The Court of Appeal in Feckett recognised this was an anomaly, but nevertheless, the inevitable consequence of the statutory wording and the fact that section 103b was placed within the general scheme for unfair dismissal claims. In short, a section 103b claim requires, consistent with the wording of the statute, the claimant to establish that the reason, or if more than one, the principal reason for the dismissal is that the claimant had made a protected disclosure. This is a more stringent causation test than the section 47b test, which only requires, as stated, the detrimental treatment to have been materially influenced by the protected disclosure. Moreover, claims under section 103b do not have the benefit of section 48.2, which, as described, uh, places the burden of proof more in favour of the claimant. Secure Care UK Limited serves as a reminder, therefore, that close attention must be paid to the correct legal causation test. If a claimant brings claims, as is often the case, under both section 47b and 103b, two different tests for causation must be applied, considered and satisfied. On this, I come to the end of the webinar. I hope I've been able to provide a, a relatively useful whistle stop tour through whistleblowing claims. Uh, the cases I've considered serve as a reminder that notwithstanding the key principles being long established and the absence of careful guidance by properly prepared counsel through the requisite elements of whistleblowing claims, the risk of appeal and increased costs for all concerned is greatly increased. Thank you for listening and do look out for future 2TG employment law webinars on this channel.